Well, I'm talking with my friend Hugh White, a uh, well-known author of The China Choice. Um, Hugh, as you know, we've recently put out a, a little Aspie strategic insight, including some of your writings and some of my writings and I think half a dozen others on a variety of issues around the China choice. So I think it's good to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk about this face-to-face, uh, -face, as, it, as it were, between two protagonists on a very interesting and, and important debate. To get the conversation rolling, why don't we start with Japan, because that's where um, our written um, uh, efforts started uh, most, most recently. Um, you obviously did have some concerns about the, um, uh, the, the contents of um, Prime Minister Abe's uh, visit to, to Canberra. Can you perhaps start by setting out for us what, what your worries are about the, the possibility of a closer Australia-Japan relationship? Yeah, look, uh, thanks Peter, and thanks for the opportunity to join you in this uh, conversation, and indeed for the exchange we had uh, that, uh, that, that you mentioned, I found it very enjoyable. Look, um, I have nothing at all against the idea of a close relationship between Australia and Japan if we view the relationship between Australia and Japan in isolation. But of course we can't because uh, that, that relationship exists within a wider Asia-Pacific strategic order. And uh, my concerns about the implications for Australia of a closer defence relationship with Japan relate entirely to how that affects the evolution of the wider Asia-Pacific strategic order. And in a nutshell, I think we're moving away from an order which has been framed by US primacy, uncontested by any of the other Asian great powers, to an order in which, as things stand at the moment, we're seeing a, a, a growing and intensifying strategic competition between the US and China. And Japan plays a very important part in that, in that competition. And indeed, the way in which Japan itself chooses to redefine its strategic posture in Asia is going to be very important to the way the US-China relationship evolves and therefore the way the whole regional system evolves. Now, my reservation about the kind of closer Australia Japan relationship that the government, our government, has been pursuing, and that Mr Abe is obviously pursuing, is that it encourages the evolution of a wider order in Asia characterised by structural rivalry between China on the one hand and a group of US allies on the other. And I don't think that's the best kind of future order for Australia. I don't think it's the best kind of future order for Japan or for the United States or for China for that matter. But by, but by supporting a, a Japanese approach and an American approach, to China's rise, which emphasises strategic rivalry and competition. I think we drive the region closer in that direction and therefore drive it away from the kind of future strategic order which would work best for us. Right. Well, there's a few things to, to unpick in that, in that logic, but I, I guess um, where it takes you in the China choice is to um, argue the case for a Japan which is somewhat more distant from the United States and almost inevitably as a result of that needs to contemplate the acquisition of nuclear weapons to, I guess, provide its own deterrent relationship with China rather than rely on American extended nuclear deterrence. And, and I'd have to say that's one of the things that I've balked at in terms of my assessment of your, of your uh, argument because I, I find it difficult to see how that, um, that type of Japan um, presents a more attractive future for the stability of the region than a Japan which is tied to the US alliance and with um, frankly the sort of constraining behaviour that it might that might be generated by countries like Australia and Japan mm. having having closer relations. So that, that puzzles me a little in the mm. in the Hugh approach is well, look, how, how you see that as being attractive. And and you're you're absolutely right. It's a feature of my argument that I find least attractive. <laughs> that is, I find, you know, when I think what kind of Asia would work for Australia, yeah. I, I found it very hard to reach the conclusion that I did reach, as mm. you quite correctly say that uh, the region would end up being more stable and Australia's interests would end up being better served um, if Japan ceased to be a strategic client of the United States. And I accept reluctantly, but, but willingly, uh, exactly as you say, the implication of that suggests that Japan would end up having needing to have a minimum nuclear deterrent capability of its own. Now, why do I think that's a better outcome for Australia? It would not be a better outcome for Australia 
um, ex except in a very different strategic order, a very different strategic setting from the one we've known. Yes. If we could continue to have US uncontested primacy, if Japan could therefore continue to rely on, on the United States for its security, then Australia's interests would be overwhelmingly served by Japan and the United States maintaining precisely the kind of a relationship they've had for a long time. That has been worked extremely well for us. But in an era in which US-China strategic rivalry grows, then, uh, and in a, in a world in which Japan becomes less and less confident of America's willingness to support uh, Japan against the United States, then I think Japanese strategic dependence on uh, the US is an inhibition to the US-China relationship settling down. It increases the likelihood that the US-China relationship becomes more adversarial, and therefore increases the likelihood that Australia finds itself in a regional order characterised by rivalry rather than by, um, rather than by cooperation. Mm -hmm. And I think the only way to resolve that is for Japan to cease to depend on the United States, therefore to depend on itself. Mm -hmm. And that, as you say, presupposes, I think, that it would most, in all probability, need to require its own nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And I would argue fairly quickly down the pike after that development would probably be a South Korean nuclear weapon and the prospects for proliferation uh, of WMD becoming significantly higher. Oh, look, I think that's at least possible. I certainly buy the argument that a quite probable consequence of Japan uh, acquiring a minimum nuclear capability would be South Korea acquiring a minimum nuclear capability. And you know, I, and, and that is a very regrettable outcome. Um, the question we have to ask ourselves, though, as is so often the case in these things, is not what do we like best, but what's the least bad outcome? And if the alternative to that is a Japan that remains strategically dependent on the United States, and therefore a Japan which uh, inhibits the United States from developing a stable and trusting relationship with China, mm because the better the US-China relationship, the less secure Japan feels. So if Japan remains strategically dependent, the US-China relationship remains adversarial, uh, the risks of a US-China confrontation grow. Yes. And the risk of, of US-China confrontation escalating to a nuclear conf confrontation is, I think, quite high. Right. I assess that as higher than many other people do, I think, because a lot of other people haven't thought very carefully about what a US-China crisis would actually look like. So you end up with a choice about whether or not we prefer a region in which more countries have nuclear weapons, but in which the likelihood of them being used remains quite low, or a region in which fewer countries have nuclear weapons, but the likelihood of them being used is higher. Yes. And I would rather live in the former than the latter uh, region, though I, though I agree it's a very difficult choice. Right. Well, um, as you say, uh, and, and it would produce, um, as, as you call it, a concert of Asia, which is really a concert of, of nuclear powers with um, a succession of perhaps smaller non-parties to the concert also considering their, their nuclear options. It's a, it's a hard-edged world, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's a very hard-edged world. It's a very different world from the one we've grown up in. But I think what we have to remember is the one we've grown up in has been fantastically privileged. Yeah. We have enjoyed, for the last 40 years, the most peaceful and stable era in Asia's millennia of history because we've enjoyed, for the first time in Asia's history, an era in which a single power and our very close ally at that has been not just the strongest power in Asia, but uncontested by any of the other region's great powers. And that is a remarkable era. I, I, I mourn the passing of that era greatly. I would like nothing better than the, that to last forever. But as China's power grows, I think it is, I hesitate to use the inevitable word, but it's as close as anything gets in our business to being inevitable that China will challenge, is already challenging, American primacy. So we no longer live in an era of uncontested US primacy. And the question we've got to ask ourselves is, what's the least bad alternative? And I think the least bad alternative is one which has the stablest possible relationship between the strongest states. Yes. And that's why I think we need a US-China rapprochement, settlement, accommodation. And that's why, and I don't think that can be achieved while Japan depends strategically on the United States. Okay. Well, well let's go to, to the essence of that, that sort of chain of logic, which is around the US-China yeah. relationship. And, and there, as you, as you would acknowledge, there are, there are elements of competition and elements of cooperation. Um, I, my start point in thinking about that would be to say that, um, you know, just as this is an unusual sort of um, unique period in terms of the, the history of Asian mm -hmm. security, so is the nature of American-Chinese um, uh, cooperation. 
unusual yeah. as well. Yeah. The, the depth of the um, yeah. economic dependence which they've created with each mm. other. Um, I, I think the uh, sort of evolution of um, you know a, a much closer uh, political engagement between the two countries on, on all manners of, uh, of issues. I mean, those things give me some confidence to say that in the balance of cooperation and competition, cooperation is actually still winning out quite quite handsomely in terms of U.S.-China relations right now. Yes, I'm much less confident of that. I absolutely agree with the premise. That is that one of the things that makes the present moment unique and extraordinarily interesting is that we've never seen two great powers as economically interdependent yes. as the US and China are today. And that does provide immense incentives for them to find a way to get on. But those incentives still have to be responded to. Mm -hmm. That is, they, they have to adapt their behaviour to respond to those incentives. Now, I believe that's perfectly possible. I'm not the gloomiest person in the room on this issue because I'm not one of those who thinks escalating strategic rivalry between the US and China is inevitable. It can be avoided. Yeah. But in order to avoid it, the US and China both have to make some compromises. Yeah. Now, at the moment, it seems to me the driver of rivalry is that the US and China have mutually incompatible views of their future relationship. The United States wants to continue to be the primary power in Asia. China probably wants to take over as the primary power in Asia. It certainly doesn't want to live under, U under US primacy, so at least wants to displace the United States and possibly replace it. Now, uh, at the moment, I think, both of them believe that they can achieve those objectives without disturbing the cooperation which you've spoken of, because they both think the other guys are going to give way. Right. The Chinese, I think, deeply believe that the United States are on the way out, and they're prepared to accept Chinese primacy. And I think they're trying to prove that with the way they're conducting themselves over issues like the Senkakus. The Americans, I think, deeply believe still that China in the end is willing to accept US primacy as a foundation for the Asian order indefinitely. I think they're both wrong. But the fact they both believe the other side's going to give way makes them both believe that they don't have to make compromises in order to preserve the benefits of cooperation. Right. And that, of course, makes a conflict more likely rather than less likely. Well, let me sort of try to pick at some, some elements of, the, of, of your, your thinking here. I mean, I, I have a slightly schizophrenic reaction to the compromise line, mm. which you've also referred to as breathing space in yeah. some of your publications. Yeah. And on the one hand, I, I, I think a reaction is to say, well, actually, the Americans have afforded China significant mm. breathing space on some areas that matter deeply to mm. the Chinese, uh, one China policy being, I mm. guess, a prime mm. example of that. Um, uh, but my the other part of my schizophrenic reaction is to say, well, but in fact, um, on on the areas where China might um, conceivably be looking for more room, more breathing mm. space, it seems um, untenable to me to suggest that the Americans ought to consider providing that breathing space. And an example of that would be, for example, over um, who who is seen to have. Um, uh, hegemony over Southeast Asia, mm. perhaps some of the, the weaker states of, uh, of um, land in mm. Southeast Asia, yeah. Cambodia, um, Laos, uh, mm. and so forth. Um, what, what, when, you, when you talk about breathing space, I mean, mm. what, what in practical terms would be the things you think America should actually be thinking about doing today or next month? What, what, does, it, what does it look like? Yeah. Okay. Look, it's a, it's, a terribly important, uh, uh, it's a terribly important question. Um, the first thing to say is that I, 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 what, what really matters is not what I think or what America thinks, it's what China thinks. Because the, the problem we're trying to manage is the stark reality of Chinese ambitions and power. Yeah. And so the question we've got to ask ourselves is not whether we think the United States has made significant concessions to China, whether China thinks that. And I, I don't think they do. Uh, that's why Xi Jinping keeps talking about a new model of great power relations, because he doesn't like the model we've got at the moment, and I think we can see in China's conduct very clear attempts to, to instrumentalise that by, by pushing, testing and challenging US leadership, demonstrating the US no longer plays the role it's played. Uh, in order to, to make space for China, in order to accommodate China, to give China a bigger leadership role, the United States would need to concede things to China which none of us would be comfortable with, China, with, with the United States conceding. I, I, I think we'd probably agree that the region would be a much better place if America could continue to play the role it's played in the past. The question for us though is not the choice between conceding some space to China and enjoying what we have enjoyed with the previous status quo. It's the choice between conceding some space to China 
and living with the consequences of not doing that, which I think is very likely to be escalating strategic rivalry. So what sort of space do I mean? Well, there's a, there's, there's a few clear tests. The first is I think the United States would have to be absolutely willing to accept the legitimacy of the Chinese political system, which I do not believe the United States does at the moment. Now, that's not to say it has to agree with or endorse everything the Chinese government does any more than Australia does, for that matter. But it does mean that the United States has to move away from what seems to me a very deeply embedded idea that the United States would like to see the kind of Chinese Communist Party lose power. It has to be willing to negotiate with China on a whole lot of issues which at the moment it seems to me the United States adopts a privilege or claims for itself a privileged position, uh, not just in the region but globally. It would need to concede that China would need to aim to impose on China no limits on the way China uses its armed forces and develops its armed forces, which it's not prepared to accept on itself. And it would need to accept China as a nuclear peer, that is a country with which it has a stable deterrent nuclear relationship, which is in America's interest as well as China's to maintain. Yeah. Now that is itself an extremely demanding list. Um, but the question we've got to ask ourselves is not do, are we happy to concede those things to China? But are we prepared to pay the costs and risks of escalating rivalry with China in order to avoid conceding those things? And I think reluctantly, but pretty confidently, we'd be better off if we can, if China's prepared to do that deal, if China's prepared to make the commensurate choices, which is a very significant question in itself, then I think we'd be better off doing that deal than taking the risks of escalating rivalry. Okay. Of course, the price of um, making concessions in those areas that you've, you've raised is that um, uh, to take the first one you mentioned, mm. accepting the legi mm. legitimacy of the current political system in China, well, of course, that is one of the most deeply contested um, points of vulnerability of the Chinese system domestically, it seems to me, uh, which is the source of you know a big debate about corruption, for example, in the Chinese system these days. Well, yes, but there's I think there are two issues there. The first is um, uh, I'm not myself persuaded that the Chinese political system is as vulnerable as a lot of others believe. Uh, it has huge problems and huge challenges. Um, but I think it would be very unwise for us to make policy in relation to China on the expectation that the CCP can't preserve its position for some time to come. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet that it, would, that, that it won't collapse, but I certainly wouldn't bet that it would. But the other point is that's an issue for the Chinese. That's an issue for the Chinese to resolve. There is a very big question about what kind of political system China should have in the future. And I don't think it's our business. It's China's business. And, and I think that's a view that would be widely shared by a lot of people in China who don't much like the CCP. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, don't, we, we, we might think there are reforms needed to our political system. We don't think that's something for China to get involved in. Well, I, I know we said that we'd limit ourselves to 15 <laughs> minutes and we're over time, but I, I do want to sort of end on just one last question, which I think is a, a bit of fun about the Australian situation yeah, yeah, and all of this. Very important. Australia really becomes a bit player in the broader theories that, that yeah, you're talking yeah, about here. Yeah. But something that I've sort of niggled at you over a, a couple of years now about about your, your line of argument is to say, as, as yet, we really have had no indication from China of anything other than satisfaction with the state of their bilateral relationship with Australia, notwithstanding the steps that have been taken to get us, to get us closer to um, the Americans through the enhanced cooperation in the North, and for that matter, the um, closer cooperation that we we're now contemplating with, with, the, uh, with the Japanese. Mm. So I'll end on, on this question, which is really to say at some point, in order for your thesis to be validated, that has to change and we have to have an angrier Beijing that really is pushing Australia on its position. When do you think that's going to happen? Uh, <coughs> I think one of the reasons why the Chinese are relatively content with the position Australia's taken is I think the successive Australian governments have actually been quite careful to manage the way they've <coughs> presented their approach to these issues um, in such a way as to avoid irritating China too much. Um, I think the government, the then government, the Gillard government, um, took some big steps forward in November 2011 with the announcement of the Darwin deployments and so on, and then took some rather more discreet but very significant steps backwards in the ensuing 12 months. Um, and uh, therefore, no. Julia Gillard got her very favourable visit to Beijing 
in April 2013. You're looking for a consistency in Australian policy implementation. No, well, I'm just <laughs> observing that the, 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 the way Australian governments have managed um, to balance their position between the US and China has been to offer something to the US and then offer something to China to keep the balance. I think it, it's still a little bit unclear how far the Abbott government is going to go in playing that game. Uh, they haven't yet taken any steps as big and significant as the Darwin announcement. Um, they have taken some bold steps on things like defining, describing Japan as Australia's best friend in Asia, uh, describing Japan as Australia's strong ally. I noticed both of those formulations seem to have dropped out of the lexicon before Mr Abbott made his successful visit to Beijing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think there's been some adroit diplomacy there on Australia's part. Um, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. I think that the one part of the secret of being Australia over the next few years is to maintain that balance as subtly as we can, but we shouldn't pretend we're not doing it. Um, we do, we have already for some time managed our relationship with the United States to take China's sensitivities into account. And we've managed our relationship with China to take US sensitivities into account. That's what it's going to. That's what it's going to be like for us. I call that good policy. Oh yeah, no, that is that is that is good <coughs> policy. It's good policy as long as the US and China have a relationship in which that kind of accommodation is possible. The risk for us, though, is that the US-China relationship uh, changes, becomes more intensely uh, adversarial, to the point where the choices we have to make are starker and starker. Mm -hmm and eventually we end up having to choose. Like everybody else, I don't want Australia to be in a position of having to choose between America and China. The risk is that if the US-China relationship gets too adversarial, we'll have to choose. And the argument I've made against, issue, against decisions like the Darwin decision is that that encourages the United States in an approach to China which makes uh, escalating rivalry more likely and therefore makes it more likely that we'll have to make that ultimate choice, the one we so badly want to avoid. Yes. Um, if it were the case that the Darwin decision was really about China, which I don't think it is, I think it's about US reassurance in, in Southeast Asia, which is a, uh, not unrelated, but it's a somewhat different, it's a somewhat different nut to crack. The, the, the Maybe, US yes, that, relationship. See, that's something on which we differ. Um, I think the pivot and the Darwin deployment were absolutely part of an American response to what they saw as a more assertive Chinese position in the region after 2008. In 2009, I think that's absolutely clear. And I think, um, you know, one might ask, what was it that changed in Southeast Asia to require the United States to deploy forces to Darwin in 2011 that hadn't been there in 2001 or 1991 for that matter? The dynamic factor, the fact which drove change in US posture in Asia, was not just the rise of China, but China's increasing assertiveness late in the last decade. And you're right to raise the point, the very significant part of my thinking about this is that I interpret the Darwin Initiative and some other things the US have done as very much directed against China, and of course so does China. Well again though, if that was really the case, that China saw it that way, surely they would have reacted you know, differently, both at the time and, and, and more recently. But oh, well, well, you know, the, the, the most tangible thing that's happened in terms of Chinese reaction to the Darwin deployment is a promise for trilateral Australia-US-Chinese cooperation happening in October next year. I mean, you could argue that the presence of American Marines in Darwin has actually made it possible for the Americans and, Chi and the Chinese to cooperate more closely in military matters. Well, you and I have both been in a business long enough to know, Peter, how little strategic significance there is in bilateral or trilateral exercises <laughs> conducted at that kind of level. Um, uh, but, you know, more, more broadly, I, I, th I think the US, um, I think the Chinese response has been carefully calculated. They've put quite a lot of pressure on Australia over it. They've made it clear that there are things they don't like. They've decided, I think, for their own reasons correctly, not to make too big a fuss about it. Uh, but uh, I, I think you'd be, I think we'd be very unwise not to draw a connection between the enthusiasm with which Australian ministers downplayed any further developments in the US-Australia relationship of the 2012 Osmond in Perth and the very warm reception that, Ms. D that Julia Gillard got in um, in uh, Beijing uh, four months later. It's all because Bob Carr read your book, The China Choice. It must be it, mate. <laughs>
It's got to be some reason for it. <laughs> well, you know, I think we should choose to continue this conversation going, and I, I, look, I look forward to a second round at some stage. It's always good fun, Hugh. Thanks very much Absolutely. for coming no, it's, a, it's a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay.